Welcome to Module 4.2. In this module, we're going to be talking about the cell membrane uh, function and how molecules are transported through the membrane. So here is an overview of a cell membrane. This is a model of the membrane called the fluid mosaic model. A mosaic is a larger part made up of individual pieces, and this is called a fluid mosaic model because these individual pieces are not tied to one place. They can move around inside the membrane. So this lipid bilayer, again with our hydrophilic heads and hydrophobic tails, gives the membrane its basic structure and serves as a permeability layer but we also have a lot of other things inside our membrane, including proteins, such as this channel here, which again can move around because we view this membrane as fluid. We also have these ring structures here. We'll remember those are called cholesterols. Those stiffen our membrane. We also have proteins with sugars on the top, called glycoproteins. Those are important for cell signaling. We also have lipids with some sugars on the top. So all of these things together move around inside our lipid bilayer membrane giving us a functional cell membrane. And again we call this the fluid mosaic model. So the main function of cell membranes is to separate and protect chemical composition. There are a lot of different things going on inside the cell and many of these things are mutually incompatible. So certain reactions need to happen in certain places. So the cell membrane, for one, keeps the cell, um, kind of gives us a barrier between outside the cell and inside the cell. But there are also a lot of membranes around our organelles, such as our mitochondria and uh, other things like a vacuole. All of these also have cell membranes. So they're all, these are basically barriers. They're going to prevent molecules on one side of the barrier from mixing with molecules on the other side of the barrier. And again, membrane proteins, which are proteins simply moving around in our cell membrane, carry out most membrane functions. So the lipid bilayer is primarily responsible for the barrier function of the membrane, and then most of the other things that the membrane does are carried out by proteins that are resident in that membrane. Some of these functions are the transport of nutrients from one side of the membrane to the other. Some of these are receptors for cell signals. So if you have a signal uh, from outside the cell, it can bind to this protein and that signal can be transduced to inside the cell. We'll talk a lot about that in later lectures. Some membrane proteins are enzymes that catalyze the reaction of a substrate into a product. And some membrane proteins are anchors in that they bind to something outside the cell and the cytoskeleton inside the cell, and they help hold the cell in place. So when we say transmembrane protein, what we're talking about is a protein that exists both inside and outside of the membrane. Here is our membrane. And we have both hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions of our proteins. So the hydrophobic regions of the proteins are going to lie on the inside of the bilayer. That's because the inside of the bilayer is hydrophobic. Again, these, this part of the protein is hydrophobic because of the R groups on the amino acids. Remember, some R groups are hydrophobic and some are hydrophilic. So most of the R groups on that part of the protein that is inside the lipid bilayer are going to be hydrophobic. There are also hydrophilic regions that are exposed to aqueous environments, either on the outside or inside of the cell. Sometimes you have multiple regions passing in and out of a membrane. So here you can see three alpha helices. One, two, three. These are inside the membrane, and they're connected by hydrophilic portions that are outside the membrane. You can also have a lot of beta sheets that span the membrane. That's shown here in this third protein. Again, the plasma membrane is a barrier. 
But we don't want to have just a barrier. Cells need to exchange molecules with their environment. They need to import nutrients, such as glucose. They need to eliminate wastes, like carbon dioxide and other products. And they need to regulate the intracellular concentration of ions. So how do they do that? Well, some molecules will simply diffuse through the membrane. And diffusion rates depend on the size and solubility in oil. So the smaller and more hydrophobic the molecule, the more rapid the diffusion through the bilayer. For instance, we have small hydrophobic molecules, such as oxygen and carbon dioxide. These will easily diffuse straight through our membrane. Remember, they are small and they are hydrophobic, so they'll easily go through our membrane. Oxygen is hydrophobic because there is no polarity, even though you have two electronegative ions. They're pulling on each other with the exact same force, so there's no region of charge. The same with carbon dioxide. It's a linear molecule of oxygen, carbon oxygen, such that there is no uh, region of charge on either side of this molecule even though those are polar bonds. These are going to diffuse easily through a membrane. Another type of molecule that can diffuse the membrane are small, uncharged polar molecules. So a molecule like water, it is polar because it has a partial negative charge on oxygen and a partial positive up here on the hydrogens. However, it is not charged and it is small, therefore it can readily diffuse through our lipid bilayer. Another example is ethanol, CH3, CH2OH. It's polar because of this electronegative carbon here. However, it is small and it does not carry a charge, so it can pretty easily go through our cell membrane. However, there are many other molecules that are larger and uncharged polar molecules, such as amino acids or glucose, that cannot pass through the membrane easily. And of course, ions, even though they are small, they carry a charge. And a charged molecule will dissolve very poorly inside our lipid membrane uh, on the interior, and so therefore they do not pass through the membrane. Remember, smaller and hydrophobic get through. Ions meet the small criteria, but they are very much not hydrophobic. They are quite hydrophilic. So something like a sodium ion will never rapidly pass through our bilayer membrane. So let's imagine we have a molecule outside this bilayer membrane. Let's imagine this is oxygen. Again, this is a very small nonpolar molecule, so it will diffuse across this membrane. You can see here we have a lot of oxygen outside the cell and none inside the cell. So this is what's called a concentration gradient concentration gradient is pointing down. In other words, there's a lot here and none here, so there's a high concentration up top and a none down. So a diffusion uh, through a permeal membrane like this moves a substance from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, and this happens over time. So here in the middle, again, we still have a concentration gradient. Some of these molecules have moved across the membrane but we still have more outside than inside. And then at the end here, you see the final result, which is an equal number of molecules both outside and inside. And this is how all of our molecules want to be. They want to have an equal uh, concentration both inside and outside. And if the plasma membrane is, uh, allows that molecule through, this will simply happen through what's called simple diffusion. But remember, there are a lot of molecules that don't simply diffuse through our membrane, such as glucose. And we really do need glucose inside our cell because that's one of the main units of energy that we get uh, the ATP that our cell needs to um, power its cellular processes. So there are many different ways to get molecules that won't readily diffuse across a plasma membrane across. And those are called transporters, and there are a couple different types of transporters. The first way we can differentiate these transporters is either by a carrier or a channel. So a carrier, shown here on the left, 
allows a solute molecule, a solute is anything that's dissolved in, in our water, to fit into the molecule. So here you see the solute going into our carrier. It binds to the carrier, then the carrier changes conformation. Remember, conformation is a fancy word for shape. So the carrier changes conformation and allows the solute to across the plasma membrane onto the other side. This is as opposed to a channel shown here on the right which discriminates based on size and electrical charge, most commonly letting ions through. Now, these channels can either be opened or closed. So a solute, if the ion channel is open, a solute simply flows down its concentration gradient to the inside of the cell in the cytoplasm. There's no binding, changing shape of the carrier protein and then releasing. It's simply a hole through the membrane that allows specific size and charged molecules through. So again, the difference is that transporters bind, change shape, and release, whereas ion channels simply allow molecules through based on size and charge. Uh, channel proteins are much quicker than uh, carrier proteins are. The second type of classification for transporters is single or coupled transport. So a single transporter is just going to move one molecule at a time. So it's a uniporter is going to move one ion or molecule at a time across the cell membrane through the transporter. Coupled transport involves the movement of more than one molecule. There are two types of coupled transporters, symporter and antiporter. Symporter is going to move molecules A and B the same direction across the cell, and antiporter is going to move the molecules opposite directions. In this case, A is going in, and B is going out. The final and third classification is passive or active transport. Passive transport occurs down the concentration gradient. So if we look at our concentration gradient, here we have little blue dots representing the molecule. It doesn't matter what molecule this is. So we have four blue dots on the outside of the cell. I always think of the top as the outside and the bottom as the inside. And we have two blue dots on the inside. So our concentration gradient is going down this way. So passive transport would involve no energy because there is a uh, concentration gradient. However, it is still facilitated diffusion because these molecules will not simply diffuse across the membrane. They require the help of a transport protein to get through. This is as opposed to active transport, which requires energy. These are like pumps. So active transport goes against the concentration gradient. So the way the molecules want to go is down into the cell. If we spend energy, we can pump one of these molecules up against the concentration gradient, and that again requires ATP, or energy. Another layer to this is when there is a voltage gradient as well as a chemical concentration gradient. This is called an electrochemical gradient. You see uh, in our cell here, inside the cell, we have a slight net negative charge, and outside the cell, we have a slight net positive charge. If we look at potassium, there's much more potassium inside the cell than there is outside the cell. We'll talk about why that is in our next lecture. So potassium concentration gradient makes it want to move down this way to outside the cell. However, there is also a chemical gradient that's going to oppose the flow of potassium. Potassium is positively charged. If there's a positive charge out here, that's going to repel the movement of potassium down this channel. So even though this channel is open, and it looks like our concentration gradient wants potassium to move this way, we also have to take into account chemical charge. And sometimes that chemical charge will oppose the movement of our ion, even though there's a concentration gradient. This is called an electrochemical gradient. Remember, electrochemical gradients consist of both voltage and chemical concentration. So how do we set up an electrochemical gradient? Well, we use something called the sodium-potassium pump, which is shown here in this brown color. 
The sodium-potassium pump moves sodium outside the cell against its concentration gradient, and potassium inside the cell also against its concentration gradient. And it does this using ATP energy. So the way this works is, sodium binds to the sodium-potassium pump, ATP binds to the pump, changing the shape of the pump, allowing the sodium to be moved to the outside. So again, this would be a carrier protein. Now potassium binds to the uh, sodium-potassium pump. This um, phosphate is removed and we change back to our original shape, allowing potassium to move inside the cell. So we're spending energy to move sodium against its concentration from inside to outside the cell, and also we're spending energy to move potassium against its concentration gradient. And this is how we're going to set up our electrochemical gradient, because now, through spending energy, we have a lot of sodium outside the cell and a lot of potassium inside the cell. And this is going to give us the gradient, which is a store of energy. Remember we talked about water in a dam, and if you have a dam here, and you have water up at the top of the dam, and water at the bottom of the dam, there is potential energy stored because of the height difference in these two uh, levels of water. There's also potential energy stored in a system like this, where you have chemical gradients, electrochemical gradients, of ions stored on opposite sides of the membrane. So this membrane kind of acts as the dam, and the ions kind of act as the water in this example. Here's that again. So like water behind a dam, which is potential energy, which we can spend on energy requiring processes, an ion gradient represents a large store of energy the same way. So again, remember this dam here is like our membrane, and the ions are on one side up here with a high concentration. And they want to move down here with a low concentration. But we're not going to let them until we open up a specific channel. And if we open up a channel that allows them to move through or down our dam, that is our release of energy. So this is how the cell is going to use the concentration gradients of ions that it sets up as energy. We're going to talk about how that works in our next lecture when we talk about how action potentials are propagated down nerve cells. So that's it for Module 4.2. Thank you for watching. Have a nice day.